Hello everybody and welcome to today's Revive webinar from the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, Guard P. I am Laura Piddock, Director of Scientific Affairs, and I will be hosting and moderating this webinar on natural product antibiotics from traditional screening to novel discovery approaches. In 2018, GARDP launched the Education and Outreach Program Revive. Revive aims to connect and support the antimicrobial research and development community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website revive.godp.org forward slash webinars. I encourage you to visit the Revive website to stay up to date about future webinars, watch recordings of previous webinars and to find other information. For example, we also host a blog about antimicrobial resistance related topics. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel as shown on this slide. We will address these questions after the presentation and do our best to respond to as many as possible. Today's speaker is Olga Genieu, Scientific Director, Fundación Medina in Spain. Olga has over 30 years of research experience in the discovery of natural novel microbial products. She obtained her PhD in chemistry from the Universidad Complutense, Madrid in 1988 from her work on the biosynthesis of secondary metabolites. In 1989, she joined the Natural Products Discovery Research Centre at Merck Sharp and Dome in Spain, where she led the Natural Products Programme and contributed to the discovery of key novel antibiotics, such as platensimycin and kibdelomycin. In 2008, she established the Foundation Medina from the former MSD Spain, Research and Development Centre and is currently its scientific director and head of the microbiology department. Her main research is focused on the production of novel microbial natural products, the exploration of novel microbial diversity to deliver novel chemistry, and the development of molecular and chemical tools to support natural product drug discovery and the identification of potential new therapeutics. She has more than 135 publications and book chapters and holds 18 international patents. Welcome, Olga. I am now holding over to you to deliver your webinar. Thank you very much, Laura. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you and I would like to to start introducing the, the, same, the webinar from today, focus on the natural products antibiotic discovery and how this the field has been evolving. And uh, just to start with, I would like uh, to, to mention first uh, the, the importance of natural products, also understood as uh, secondary metabolites, uh, compounds that are introduced uh, as specialized metabolites by the producing organisms. There are low molecular weight molecules, there are non-essential for growth, but that present a, a broad uh, chemical diversity. It has been observed that these, uh, these uh, compounds are concentrated in certain groups of, uh, of organisms, of course, within animals. You can find them in sponges, in corals, in other marine vertebrates. It's well known the presence of uh, plants of, uh, that are highly producers of a 
broad diversity of, of molecules that have been used in, in traditional medicine. But of course, uh, there is a major role of microorganisms as producers of uh, molecules with biological activity that has been used during decades by the pharmaceutical company. So there is more than 30,000 metabolites of microbial origins today being described as natural products in the databases. They, they exhibit a broad range of therapeutic applications and uh, in fact, more than 90% of the anti antibiotic scaffolds uh, uh, that have been developed later on into, into the clinic, they were discovered from, from microbial, microbial strains. So they, they represent an unlimited source of a structural diversity that is still uh, today of high interest. And uh, of course, uh, microbial, microbial natural products have been pivotal for modern antibiotic discovery with this unique, unique clinical space compared to, to synthetic libraries. What you can see on the, on the picture is in fact just an analysis, a comparative analysis of different subsets coming from combinatorial compound libraries, natural products, and drugs that managed to get to, to the clinic. And by comparing different properties uh, of these molecules, chemical properties in terms of centers or just the, the number of uh, different type of bonds, nitrogen, nat oxygen, and halogen bonds. So these chemical properties were compared and you can, you can observe that in fact the natural products just uh, position themselves with a chemical space that is quite similar to those of the, of the compounds that can manage to get developed as, as drugs. At the same time, uh, they, they, these molecules have been evolving with nature. Uh, there is a long evolution selection of these, of these molecules and ensuring their optimized activity as ligands, enzyme, enzyme inhibitors, allosteric effectors, or even inhibitors of protein-protein interactions. So they are really, really playing a role in nature. And this is just this potency that we want to exploit to, to develop potential compounds uh, from, from there. There is still a huge underexplored microbial sources uh, with potential novelty uh, and novel classes that we are very much interested to, to exploit. And in fact, there are outstanding scaffold starting points for, for the chemist, for, for the developer of new candidate anti antibiotics. So uh, still today, they are really, really con considered as privileged structures, as excellent templates for the synthesis of novel, novel molecules that are showing biologically activity and also derive uh, 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 molecules which are inspired in these, in these structures. Despite this uh, richness, there's been a lot of, of, lot of uh, controversy and discussion around to much extent this chemical diversity can be expanded in the, in, the, in the field, in the area. And in fact, because there is more and more published natural products that have structural similarity to previous published uh, compounds. So in this graph, you can see that in fact, uh, with the years, uh, I'm sorry that at the end, you don't see the, the scale of the years at the bottom of these graphs. Uh, there's been a continuous increase in the, in the number of new natural products that was most slowing down after of course, industry as well left the, the field and a decrease in the, in the, in the sense of the, of the novelty that was, uh, was identified from the novel identification. But if we consider in terms of uh, numbers, total numbers of novel scaffolds, we see that despite on the right graph, that each year we have a continuous uh, discovery of novel scaffolds, novel chemical space that is being produced from these sources. So there is still a source, a way to explore this structural diversity. And these are the innovative discovery methods that need to be able to pull from this diversity and translate this, uh, this uh, chemical diversity in potential novel scaffolds, novel drugs to be used in the, in the discovery. In this sense, uh, I would like to put in context where these microbial natural products come from. And in fact, uh, major sources are in terms of within the, the bacterial world, on one side are filamenting bacteria, which have been one of the major producers of more than 60% of the commercial antibiotics. We also uh, find in these uh, in these uh, groups uh, fungal fungal uh, uh, molecules, fungal natural products. So about only 10 to 15% of the fungal species have 
been already been described, we can estimate that in fact uh, above the 70,000 accepted species, uh, there is more than half, one million and a half uh, of estimated species still to be to be explored. There are of course many other privileged groups of bacterial uh, taxa, which are bacilli, pseudomonas, cyanobacteria, mixobacteria, that today represent more than 70%, and more and more these groups are are explored. We are finding novel chemistry among these uh, these uh, taxonomic groups. So there is a wealth to be to be exploited in this in this context and and today uh, with the use of uh, and the, the richness of the molecular tools and the, and the genomics of course these studies have been suggested not only just the abundancy but also the diversity in all the biosynthetic genes that are involved in the biosynthesis of these compounds and in fact, uh, they are really, really pointing into the, the direction that in fact, uh, these uh, specialized metabolites are really concentrated in taxa that harbor large genomes. Uh, in fact, most of these metabolites are unknown because they are remain silent or very produced in very small amounts. And most of the cases they have been evading their detection in lab conditions. So, uh, despite that they are not widely distributed, what we want to do is just to concentrate on the most promising groups of microbial uh, strains to be exploited for the production of these, of these compounds. Of course, uncultivable microbes is a challenge. It's a challenge about uh, how to manage that. Today we have the tools to exploit these potential resources. And of course, there are many of them that do not have enough amount of genetic, genetic material to, to devote significant coding capacity to secondary metabolism. But there are still a large proportion of strains that are still waiting, waiting to be discovered. So this is why there is a major focus on genome mining and uh, just to focus the discovery of natural products from cultural micro microbes, from the broadest uh, diversity of phylogenetic groups that are harboring large genomes that have a better, better promising sources for, for novel uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. So uh, we also are facing challenges and opportunities for natural product discovery. Of course, as we know, is the major limitations in sense of the poor bioavailability of these molecules or the structural complexity that has been restraining uh, from the medicinal chemistry perspective how to how to develop these uh, these compounds into drugs. Of course, there's been advances in the field in terms of genome mining, engineering of biosynthetic pathways, biocombinering. There are a lot of synthetic methodologies that are helping us to overcome the barriers of structural complexity that were in the past. So today, these approaches are, are amenable. And they are offering, from the drug development perspective, the way or just new avenues for the derivative the rapidization and semi-synthesis of the, of the compounds just to be able to uh, complete total synthesis, divert total synthesis from the original pharmacophore, or even use a, a, a de a design libraries just inspire, inspire in these in this natural products. Uh, from the perspective of the antibiotic diversity, that is also the, the topic that is taking us today. Of course, uh, we, we need to face that we need to overcome the emerging drug resistance of, uh, of known antibiotics today in, in play and, and the challenge to identify not only just novel classes but novel mode of action. This is the, the final aim, but in between we, there are many other ways to approach the, the problem. There is, there is a, the possibility to extend the life of the existing antibiotics by, by combinations. Uh, just uh, the challenge to achieve that the new compounds manage to have lower lower frequencies of resistance than those that we have at hand this is one of the first points that we need to address, but at the same time address in the design of the of the strategic approach for the discovery how we are going to manage the the, the barriers the challenges imposed by the outer membranes the cell penetration the effluxes the resistance natural resistance of the of the strains and once we have an excellent candidate then uh, the, the limitations to overcome the, if this is efficacious in, in animal models of infection, and then if this can be developed into, into humans without any potential safety issues. So this is all at stake, and in fact, we know that if we consider from the novelty of the chemical classes, in fact, since year 2000, there's only been two, five novel classes 
been uh, developed into, into the clinic, despite the, the large number of new launches. Of course, there is only uh, novelty in terms of the structural novelty from the chemistry in five cases. And in fact, the three of them are, are coming, uh, originated from, from natural products. And these new classes, in fact, are limited to gram-positive infections. So we don't have today novel classes to fight uh, gram-positive, gram-negative infection uh, uh, pathogens. So there's been discussion about uh, well, the, one of the problems in the past, uh, uh, how, how to address discovery. I mean, going into traditional screening uh, from the top-down approaches in, in the sense of starting with large number of strains or compounds or of libraries of extracts that have been not been much more uh, characterized and going blindly into trying to integrate uh, these uh, screens that can be help us just to identify hits but there is also the issue of uh, about the rediscovery of non compounds and uh, also having to follow the, the bioassay guide isolation or chemical signature guided isolation. So this is being confronted to other approaches that are be also being developed and more bottom up in the sense, let's focus first on few well-characterized strains that can be promising uh, producers of novelty from the information that we may have in terms of the genomic richness from the from the potential in terms of uh, biosynthesis of novel metabolites and uh, using this just genetic information driven natural products prediction to select those that will be used in the screen or then just used to apply some activation or heterogeneous expression to then achieve uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that is in fact the isolation and an activity profiling or something that is promising. So at the end, we need to deal with both, uh, both type of approaches and, and both of them can, can be combined. Because in fact, uh, this uh, omics driven antibiotic discovery that in fact uh, considers to start from a given strain and to go deeper into understanding what this strain is able to produce to deliver at the end a potential hit compound, uh, at the end, no matter the, the, the approach that you use, uh, you, you need to focus on, on the strains and their metabolites and how you can achieve to have these metabolites being produced in culture to, to be able to work with them. So this is starts always with a small numbers of highly characterized strains, uh, strains with unique environments to overcome uh, strains that have already been exhausted and, and intensively uh, uh, studied. And what is more important, are there still minor and overlooked metabolites that deserve to be looked at and we have been completely overlooking in, in the past. There is a really a new role of, of the, uh, the approaches that consider minoring for novel pathways, uh, including strain engineering, refactoring uh, promoters, uh, including regulators, trying to achieve just uh, activation of all these pathways that we see in the genomes, but that we don't see translated into molecules. And having this been expressed in the original wild type strain or just uh, cloned in heterologous uh, host. So this is to deal today a big challenge to manage to, that, to do that at the industrial scale. And at the end, uh, there are some other approaches that are also being developed in the sense of willing to go deeper into some certain antibiotic classes and uh, mining for specific biosynthetic genes, which can be structurally related to non-antibiotics to, to expand the, the, the space around this potential diversity of molecules that can be produced by, by these microbial, microbial strains. And from the other perspective, to look for novel compounds just on, on the search and initial search of antibiotic resistant genes. So all these initiatives are today uh, coexisting and trying to, to move ahead, but no matter that this is integrating many different types of disciplines and today we cannot consider the discovery of any natural product without combining these key factors in the sense of without the quality of the sources, this can be just the cultivated strains or the genomes that you are starting with. Uh, at the end, you need to, to just to make this translated into molecules. So we need to uh, ensure that we are using the right culture-based approaches as well as to uh, ensure that you can have the heterogeneous gene expression. And at the end, all together, this library has been using the appropriate screens. All this today requires a, a combination of disciplines that are just entering into, into the space. And this includes the microbial uh, ecology, 
a lot of uh, chemistry tools that have been evolving just to support the, the field. At the same time, all the uh, system biology and synthetic biology tools that today are key just to move ahead and understanding how these compounds are being produced. So I, I would go, I don't go into, into the detail in all this really, really busy, busy slide, but this is just a summary of what has been in the past, uh, the early stages for antibiotic discovery, and many of these steps are still valid. And uh, the point is what, what is being, being fed with and how we are going to be generating these published libraries. At the end, this can be just the sources, there's this new strain, but this can be also this heterologous expression, host harboring just genes from, from the environment. At the end, this is key in terms of what you're going to feed your system, you're going to feed your, your, your high throughput screen program to deliver at the end the, the better hist, hits that can be replicated against the, the, the early LCMS replication uh, pr uh, platforms to, to really get rid of anything that is known in the first pass and then focus very, very carefully on the isolation of the most interesting compounds to deliver the active compound that will be later on be just developed into potential leads once they have been uh, ensuring to move ahead through the, through the program. So uh, at the end, uh, we have key points that need to be addressed when we want to discover uh, new natural products antibiotics. And we will cover all of them in the following slide. One thing is the sources of the compounds. Uh, another point is the natural product chemistry tools that are helping us just to, to understand much better and to go much faster into what is really of interest and novel. And then what can be the different types of screener approaches that can be used to to integrate all these and deliver at the end potential novelty in the in the antibiotics we are aiming to discover. So to start with, of course, we, we, we still have to bear in mind that in fact our macro collections uh, are unique reservoirs of diversity. They have been put together after decades of effort of microbiology sourcing all over the world and they, they merit to be exploited with a completely new different perspective. Of course, they have been intensively exploited you know, using limited number of conditions, but there is a wealth in terms of the uh, genes able to produce novel molecules that have not been fully, fully explored so, so far. On top of that, there is also the, the option to go to continue to mine the environment, but to really understand where you are going to mine, what type of associations you are looking to exploit, what kind of unique marine environments you want to exploit compared to the terrestrial ones, uh, the approaches that can be used uh, uh, with non cultivated strains are also uh, present a lot of challenges, and also those related with the culture independent discovery. So all these approaches are still there, but needs to translate into strains that can be able to express and then produce, uh, translate that into, into small molecules that can be used to, to be screened. So anything that we do needs to be uh, focus on, on tapping these silent biosynthetic pathways, exploring culture uh, cell si signaling, and being able of, of imaging in some way uh, when these response do occur and then we can extract information from there. So there have been always traditional approaches just to, uh, uh, to use the culture-based uh, uh, approach to express under explore natural products and uh, we can just modify the, the cultivation conditions just by the traditional OSMAC approach. We can include the stress factors, it, uh, in, include chemical inducers, epigenetic modifiers in the case of fungi. We can explore, as I was mentioning, the crosstalk between, between strains, anything that can trigger uh, the production of uh, novel, novel molecules and to ensure that we have high quality libraries of microbial extract ready, ready to be used. In this sense, we have a multitude of uh, formats that can be explored to, to be used from the miniaturized uh, microplates to the large, large uh, uh, bioreactors. So depending on, on the needs, we can employ more on another. And of course, uh, the, the focus libraries, uh, we, are, we are really, really willing to, to, to define chemically enriched models uh, from microbial fermentations that can range from, from just crude extract that are clean, just the mixtures of components extracted from, the, from these fermentations to different type of fractions which are more cleaner 
and sometimes much more compatible to certain assays to uh, also just generate at the end pure compound uh, uh, natural product collections with individual individual uh, uh, molecules. So all this is available to be used in the in the screening. And also what I was mentioning is the 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 uh, the importance of the different tools that we have uh, regarding the, the analysis of what is contained in the in the in these extracts in this in this uh, fermentation broth that is helping us to understand the behavior in the different conditions that we are using and uh, to map to map uh, in in the space what is the response of the strain confronted to the different conditions. So these kind of tools, which are based on mass spectrometry, as you can see, this is just mapping the response of, of a strain that has been exposed to different to different uh, factors, addition, different antibiotics, and, and sense, which is the, the metabolic response of the strain. This is also very helpful to compare the conditions and to focus on specific uh, individuals in, in within the, the mixtures of molecules that we have in our in our extracts. At the same time, we can also do an MS2 analysis and go much deeper into individual strains and try to, to establish networks of, uh, for masses of ions and then from there identify potential uh, points that are just pointing into, into the presence of novel, novel, novel molecules. But at the same time, what is very, very interesting is to use some of the statistical approaches that are helping us to compare strains just uh, exposed to different conditions and see how they can be producing molecules in one condition that is absent in the in the other. So this is just an, uh, an example of, of uh, two different conditions from a fungal strain where you have that in fact depending on the type of growth you have a different pigmentation but you also have a different distribution of the molecules that are being produced. So this is very informative what you want to point into some specialized molecules or special last strain that you want to exploit in depth. So this kind of approaches have been used intensively in our lab just to, to understand what is the behavior of the strains in different conditions. Here you, we already have another case of a fungus that is growing uh, more and more, more, much more as a, uh, as a yeast or in the other cases it is growing as a, as a filamentous fungus. And in the, the fact that the Pigment production is different, but also have the production of novel metabolites in one case that is completely absent in the in the other. This is also helping us to, to look into the, these molecules and then to focus our isolation on this specific family of compounds. And similarly, this is something that has been uh, approached for many, many other, other cases. So it's not only just the sources, but the, the, the chemistry tool, but all of these are helping us to combined with the, with the screening approaches that in fact combine not only just the target-based assays but also the, the different type of phenotypic screens. So the antibacterial screening funnel, I'm getting back to the original uh, uh, path that I was describing there, but it's going to be key is how we are going to be approaching to exploit these libraries. Uh, this can be uh, something that is going to take us to the to the heat identification and later on quickly from the early mass spectra replication to the isolation and structural elucidation on any novel molecule. So these uh, these uh, steps are key in just enriching any pipeline for, for uh, any antibiotic discovery. And in fact, when we are considering the different type of uh, antibiotic uh, approaches, uh, of course, we, we can have on one side the target-based assays. It can be on one side just in vitro assays on validated targets with enzymatic assays, even with all CMS based assays, where we are going to identify the potential binding or just uh, on a specific validated uh, protein. And uh, or just uh, just a target-based whole cell screens where we are going to have reporters, sensitized strains, this can be antisense, uh, uh, modulated uh, genes that at the end are going to just hit any essential uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, genes uh, involving the RNA synthesis. This can be protein translation, DNA replication, cellular synthesis, and or any other uh, strategy that we may identify as potentially 
applicable in, in this case. So on one side, these, uh, these target-based uh, approaches uh, are confronted to on the other side on the completely different typic assays where we are just uh, running wholesale liquid assays on, on growth inhibition as endpoints. This can be absorbance, this can be fluorescence or luminescence in liquid or agar-based. And at the end, what we want to detect is the the, uh, the, the potency of, uh, of, our, of our sample to be able to, to kill and to be able to penetrate and have an effect on the, on the potential pathogen. These assays can be run on large panels of, of pathogens, but at the end, what we need is to, to go quickly into, into the mode of action because, of course, these phenotypic assays are providing any clue about what is ongoing there. Uh, we need to integrate uh, platforms that are helping us to for profiling for the for the mode of action and there are many examples of, of these platforms that were developed uh, in the last decades uh, focus as such as the Sapphorus target array there's been also knockouts being generated uh, in in gram negatives as well as any other panels of strains with the portal genes that are really really showing up which can be the potential uh, targets or the mode of action of this of this compost. So all these approaches are, are coexistent in many cases. So one after another are being applied and necessarily they don't need to be in, in conflict. So in the case of the phenotypic assays, so some just to show some, some examples, is uh, normally they are being run such as, as wholesale liquid assays, as, as growth inhibition, as I was mentioning. And uh, we can include the, the broad spectrum, the negative uh, antibiotics using panels of, of human pathogens uh, and multi-resistance strains. We can also aim uh, uh, against uh, gram-positive antibiotics, specifically in terms of uh, Neisseria and, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Or we can also aim at uh, just identifying synergies and potentiators of antibiotic activity. Also, biofilm generation and biofilm uh, disruption is also a key point in, in the uh, antibiotic uh, discovery area. And there are more and more cases in which uh, we are just considering if we can use uh, uh, the mimetic conditions of the infection niche, niche to be used as potentially uncover some uh, some uh, points that can be used for the for targeting uh, uh, some some strains that can be just as the case of Euro, Europathogenic strains. Um, here you, you have uh, just uh, the typical uh, plate that is being used for uh, inhibition growth in a high throughput screen, where we see that in fact we are going to measure the changes in growth by density and absorbance. But at the same time, we can use uh, fluorometric readouts to, to sense uh, the the bioactivity uh, of uh, uh, of the of the strain. So we can both both uh, combination can help us just to uh, assess the the potential effect of any any sample on the on the bacterial bacterial growth. So this is also being applied uh, to to look for synergies assays. So in this case uh, with with on, on two different types of pathogens. This is just an example of a, of a pilot screening using uh, microbial extracts, where you can see that, in fact, from the, the cloud of, uh, uh, of points that were generated from the screening, you have uh, extract coming from, uh, from fungi in, in pink and, and from uh, bacteria in, uh, in blue. At the end, you have a subset of uh, hits that are showing synergy that, in fact, are those that are exhibiting activity when you are using the, the, the extract in combination with a sub uh, uh, a concentration of, uh, of the antibiotic. And on the other side, we have uh, just the uh, antibacterial hits that, in fact, are only only showing activity uh, alone, and the same the same behavior is also uh, observed with uh, with the test against Acinetobacter. And what was also much interesting is to see that in fact there is not so much overlap in how the the, the extract behave uh, in terms of the synergy depending depending on the depending on the pathogen that is being used. So that is also aiming and uh, is also helping us to, to point into one direction or another, depending on the different subsets of samples that we have been tested. So in this slide, what you have is a summary 
of, uh, of the results when we are comparing on one side the synergy and on the other side how the, com the, the overlap or not the antibacterial activity against both pathogens. And another example, this will be another one for in the case of the biofilm inhibition assays, uh, of course they have been uh, intensively used and uh, that's, uh, that's why I'm, I'm showing here. On one side is just how to inhibit in biofilm formation and on the other side inhibiting the, uh, and promoting the degradation of the, of the biofilm and or in, in uh, extracts from microbial and microbial strains are also extremely useful to quickly go through this type of assays to be able to infer on one side on the inhibition of the strains that are still planktonic and then later on score for the destruction or the degradation of this biofilm of the pervasion of this formation. And on the right what you have is just a, a snapshot of what the, the screening plates um, can look at when you are running just a, a small pilot of, of different type of extract. So in summary, these are the, the different type of, of approaches we are using on any heat, uh, early heat the replication by LCMS and with our internal databases, with public databases, just to very quickly infer for the presence of any non-compound to, to avoid using and spending any, any effort in the isolation of these compounds. And as you can see here, we have a cumulation of uh, the annotation by LCMS uh, of uh, a series of uh, of extracts, and, you, and can you see that there are recurrently some uh, some compounds that are being obtained from certain groups, uh, certain specific groups of, of strains. So this is just an example of, of how quickly you can get rid of, of the molecules that you are not interested, and you can go into the, the molecules of the highest interest. Uh, this uh, this uh, slide only shows uh, just uh, uh, this general scheme of the biacid guide fractionation and purification that is being used once we identify a heat, and then after several rounds of uh, of uh, biacid guide isolation, where you need to combine both the, the fractionation and the assay to guide you in which fraction is is uh, you can track. The, the activity of your of your extract. At the end, we have a few compound with a novel structure that is uh, is being used, elucidated, and then uh, on the on the novelty deciding if you if you move ahead with the development. So this is just a few examples of among compounds that were obtained from the recent screens in our center. Uh, most of them are just essentially active against gram positive. There are some other cases that were also active against uh, gram negative pathogens. And I will focus the last minutes of my talk just to, to get uh, through three examples that were obtained from our screens. In one case, this was a very focused library focused on, on uh, strains coming from sponges and from a given specific taxonomy group that were just uh, cultivated in different conditions, mimicking the marine environment, and uh, we, that were screened on a very small panel of, of pathogens. And uh, this will enable us just to discover uh, a new Tyrosolide peptide from this uh, marine, marine actinomycetes, this curia, and we had uh, different isolates coming from different specimens of the sponges. And in fact, it was extremely potent against Staphylococcus, as many other tyrosolide peptides, and with a similarity in the structure to previously discover compounds in of the of the same uh, chemical chemical class. So there is still a diversity that can be just generated from this type of molecules from the specific specific groups. Another good example is uh, just uh, the series of the MDNs uh, 57 to 60 that were discovered a few years ago with a broad spectrum against uh, gram-negative pathogens. They are produced by uh, a fungal uh, pathogen of plants. And as uh, this was obtained from a, from a phenotypic screen of, uh, against this, uh, this panel of negative pathogens, and, and this is a family of four related compounds uh, with a small uh, molecular range that in fact is a completely novel and not reported chemical scaffold that was not known to any, any non-antibiotics. And uh, the MIC values, when they were purified, they were really uh, nice against E. coli and uh, Pseudomonas and, and Acinetobacter. There was some in a, in a range that was just suggesting that were potentially of interest to be exploited more in depth. So these, these compounds uh, were, having activities uh, level affected 
with the multi-cloud uh, systems. Uh, they were not uh, uh, altered in, in the polymixing resistant pathogens. Uh, uh, we were just exploring. There were some kind of cross uh, uh, inactivation within these cases. And uh, we also explore that uh, these uh, compounds against different type of multi-drug resistant uh, clinical clinical strains. So the summary uh, about the activity profile of these molecules are summarized in this in this uh, table. As you can see, that in fact, uh, especially for MDN57, uh, we had a, a nice a nice profile that was uh, suggesting the interest in exploring more in depth if this uh, new scaffold could be used as potentially as a, as a, as a potential lead for, for development. So this, uh, this compound, of course, we had no clue about the, the mode of action. Uh, and uh, in collaboration with uh, the scientists from Cubist, as well from the University of California in San Diego, we explored the, the, the Initially, how these these compounds uh, were going to to be uh, acting, and there was some the initial test that suggested this uh, inhibition of cell wall biosynthesis. Uh, that in fact uh, uh, we we identified the compound uh, as permeabilizing the, the the membrane and uh, disrupting the membrane potential. So that's why we were we were observing this kind of uh, inhibition of cell wall biosynthesis. Uh, this uh, compound was also uh, undergo went uh, uh, just uh, some preliminary safety data uh, analysis, and uh, it was despite this challenge in chemistry that the compound was uh, proposing, we had a, a very good in vitro safety window with a good stability from the metabolic and chemical perspective. We didn't see any cytotoxic activity or any liabilities from the perspective of the cardiotoxicity of the compound and moderate uh, cytochrome uh, as a form inhibition. So this was suggesting that potentially this could be uh, a compound to, to be used. And that's why this was proposed within uh, the uh, new drugs for back cells enabled program. And this was one of the first cases from programs that were run within this uh, consortium. And uh, in, a, in a few months, uh, we, we really we really observed that after the in vitro in vitro in vivo assays in, in animals, we observe a very pronounced uh, in vivo toxicity together with a high frequency of resistance that uh, suggested the uh, discontinuation of, of the program. So that's another example of how a, a program can quickly be killed by by the the fact that in fact it cannot be cannot be pursued. And my, my final example is uh, uh, another example of how we will need to, to sometimes go back and reconsider initial decisions. And this is just a case of one of our strains that in fact is a streptomyces that initially we had a broad uh, profile of activity against the four pathogens that we had in our panel. But that uh, we didn't continue to work on that because the, the early the replication by MASPEC was suggesting the presence of actinin in anacardinine that was explaining this, this activity against the grand negatives. Uh, after the time, we, we just reviewed the, all, all hits and then we had a new look at uh, more, more in detail. And, and, under, and this, in this case, this strain, this extract was when they went uh, uh, some level of bioacid guide fractionation. And by going through all the process again from the fresh material, as this is shown in this in this picture, uh, what we were able to to see that in fact uh, the this uh, this extract contained many more molecules that we had already been identifying by by LCMS, and one of them was of, of high interest. In fact, the the, the fraction the, the the component was uh, just containing one of these fractions. That when we purified and isolated, uh, we found out that it was a completely new uh, lecol antipeptide with a with a nice antibacterial against the gram protein uh, pathogens, including including Clostridium difficile. So this is just in fact summarizing the the profile of the compound against the, the panel so far that we have been testing uh, in in the lab that uh, we would like to to expand to other to other resistant mutants. 
But the most interesting, and in fact, as is the, the initial test that was suggesting that in fact uh, this compound uh, was was also uh, related to the cell wall biosynthesis as the, as a potential target pathway. And the initial initial reported was also suggesting that it was interfering with the lipid two cycle. So this uh, is now being uh, but being uh, studied and and uh, the mode of action of this compound that has been developed in collaboration with. Anya Schneider will be will be disclosed uh, in the in the short term. So in summary, this is uh, just the, the way to how we, uh, an example of of, uh, of uh, getting back to to all data that in fact uh, and the, 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 to exploit the richness of all these trends that is suggesting that in fact uh, we were able to achieve the, the discovery a completely novel uh, glycosylated lantipeptide with a completely unprecedented chemical features. And uh, this activity against uh, these relevant gram-positive pathogens is also of a high interest in, in going deeper into, into this unusual mode of action. So as a final slide, I would like to just to mention as last comment that in fact, uh, I, I hope I have been taking you. I can convince you that in fact, natural products continue to be key sources of structural diversity and novelty, uh, really important in type of antibiotic discovery strategies, that in fact all the new isolation approaches and metabolome mining methods that are today available to explore the new environments uh, are, and the new uh, the underexplored microbial collections are key for, for I think, on the, uh, discovering new pathways and, and molecules. Uh, the tools that we have are helping us to efficiently reduce uh, the times and, and the costs for deconvolution and purification that we had in the past. So this is something that we can implement very quickly in the in the process and with the in outcome of the synthetic biology tools are also helping us. So these disciplines today are merging and, and biologists and chemists are working together into, into the field of discovery. Of course, uh, what is key is our just to have uh, really, really good high throughput screening strategies that can be just introducing and integrating the way just to be able to detect the presence of these uh, new new compounds and uh, overcoming the, the challenges of the penetration and the efflux and, and circumvent other microbial barriers that are still there. And uh, the efficient the convolution and mode of action profiling tools are today, today still key to select for the best and potential new new antibiotics. And uh, I will stay here and I will be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Olga, for sharing uh, your experience and expertise and an excellent presentation. We will now start the question and answer session. As a quick reminder to the audience, please send your questions via the questions window on your webinar control panel. And we'll do our best to ask and respond to as many as possible for the duration of this webinar session. So firstly, Olga, um, what are the major bottlenecks, challenges, or issues today in discovering new antibiotics from natural products? Well, today, as I've been mentioning through the presentation, in fact, uh, one of the key points is how to circumvent and to get rid of what is already known and to go deeper into the new chemical space that, uh, that is out there and we have not been able to, to get into, into the screening process. So uh, at the end, it's just how to have refine, refine uh, selection of strains, selection of compounds or libraries that can ensure that at the end you can uh, feed the, the screening process with the best quality materials to, to be challenged against the, the, the different type of targets. So that's today one of the major problems and uh, the combination of uh, the new approaches that are, are now at stake and, and the new technologies are helping us just to reduce from the large numbers to much focused libraries and to go deeper into the most interesting strains that can be produced in novel compounds. Thank you. So far, no molecules derived from synthetic approaches are in the pipeline. 
to what extent will new synthetic biology approaches support the expansion of the contribution of natural products to the discovery and development of new antibiotic drugs for patients? Well, and the, there is still a time that we will need to, to be able to discover and then develop uh, potential novel compounds coming from all these synthetic approaches. Uh, of course, all these synthetic approaches are managing to show that we can just uh, be able, we can explore and exploit the, the, uh, the resources that are still there. Uh, there are not high throughput screenings just fed by these, these approaches to be able to deliver novel compounds. So these approaches so far have been able to show that they can just generate molecules. Uh, there's been not enough molecules being confronted with uh, with the the patent uh, with the with the pathogens uh, to be able to to deliver compounds that could be developed because the major bottlenecks at the end is just to be able to circumvent the, the limitations that we have for development so this is much more higher the the barrier for any for any molecule today that it was in the in the past so this will require community effort just to go into this into this way. Thank you. In the discovery screening process, do you look early on for cytotoxicity so as to avoid finding those toxic compounds later on? This depends very much on what you're you're aiming to. I mean in the discovery process in the case that you are using extracts, uh, probably the cytotoxicity doesn't need to be linked to the molecule that you are uh, uh, looking for the bioactivity against the microbial pathogens. Of course, in the case of pure compounds, you will be looking very early in the process because you will be associating any activity with, uh, with the compound that you have been identifying as bio biological active. In the case of the, of the extracts or just uh, the fractions, uh, normally, if you go through the, the cytotoxicity, you wait to have some fractionation to be sure that you have been able to spread the complexity of the sample to avoid uh, just uh, missing, missing any interesting compound because you're labeling that as a, as a cytotoxic. Thank you. Why are most natural products active against gram-positive bacteria and not gram-negative bacteria? Is it that they are large, bulky molecules that cannot penetrate the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria? Well, within, within natural products, microbial natural products, there's a broad range of sizes, so not all of them are just large molecules. But of course, uh, the, the outer membrane barrier is, is, uh, is, is a barrier not only for, for natural products, but also for any kind of uh, molecule. So this is today one of the major problems just to develop any compound against, uh, against uh, gram negatives. So the, the fact of being able to pass through all the different barriers, especially when you're aiming at uh, intracellular targets. Yeah. Thank you. Is the traditional top-down approach not sensible to consider at all? So, for instance, what about screening HPLC fractions of actinomyces culture broths for a large number of various bioactivities? It may be that you find a compound that's not novel, but today its activity may be novel. Is this worth pursuing? This is uh, just a question of numbers and how you can uh, if you you can manage to, to 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 screen fractions with the cost of generating the fractions instead of screening the extracts. So this uh, kind of activity can be quickly uh, seen by screening first the extract and later on going deeper into the fractions. Uh, and not avoiding to look more carefully into that. So this first activity can also be observed by screening the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole extracts from the beginning. Thank you. This question is about databases for dereplication. Are there good open source databases for dereplication that new groups entering the field could use because they may not have access to the in-house database such as that 
you have? Well, in fact, we are combining proprietary databases, but at the same time, we are using the dictionary natural products as well. And this is just commercially available and, and this is open for the public. And there is more and more initiatives willing to put into common the mass spec uh, databases that have been put together by different actors. And I imagine that in the, in the next uh, years, we will see more these open source uh, common databases to, to be used by the community. Thank you. I have a question now about MDN 0207. And the question is, it is poorly active against visa strains. Do you know why this is? No, we have not been going deeper into understanding what uh, what uh, is the difference uh, at this moment and uh, once we have been uh, the convoluted the, the mode of action of the compounds then in this case we could be able to talk more carefully into that because this is just the first observation on this uh, on these strains but th this has been already pointed out by many others but we don't have any answer at this moment Thank you. I've also been uh, given a second question on the MDN molecule, uh, which you indicated uh, was uh, terminated. The program was terminated because of toxicity. Are you able to share with us what type of toxicity was seen? Well, in fact, this was acute toxicity when this was uh, just injected into, into mice. And uh, this was uh, just uh, really lethality in a few few minutes, uh, hours. So this was something that was not explored any further because at the same time we were obtaining uh, results from the high frequency of the resistance of the of the compound that was also a no-go in the in the case of this program. Yeah, but we didn't study more in depth about uh, how what what was the reason for this toxicity. And then another question um, based on that program, but you may wish to answer more generally as well. Is it possible to give an estimation of the time it took from discovery of MDN uh, compound to the closure of the program? So how long did it take for you to do all of that work and then find that, that you could go no further? Well, uh, I have uh, this was a split into different trials, and, and uh, then what I can tell is uh, uh, from the time it entered the, the program within the enable until the, the closure of the program, this was less than six, seven months. So this was very quickly done all, all the process. Uh, the, this was probably one year for from the discovery to the characterization of the of the molecule from the original extract. So today. Uh, this is rather rather fast from the from the heat pointing to the uh, isolation of the compound and having the molecule at hand. This is really happening in the average cases. So this can be three to six months to have the the pure compound, and later on just to pursue the the other the other in vitro assays to assess the the potential potential interest of the molecule can be spending for another for another three to, to six months. So this was not extended too long from the from the discovery time. Thank you. Um, are there any studies comparing the speed of resistance development between natural product antibiotics versus semi-synthetic antibiotics or even synthetic antibiotics so the question is asking is resistance development quicker for one type of antibiotic versus another well this will depend on the mode of action of the, of the antibiotic there are cases of natural products that we, we didn't find any way to to generate in a resistant uh, one one case one example is texobactin i mean this was a really really almost impossible to, to generate the resistant mutant. And in other cases, we, we have very uh, low frequency, uh, very high frequency of resistance. Uh, imagine that in the case of the chemical compounds is also is related with the, uh, how easy the, the strain can generate a mutation just to, to overcome the effect of the, of the compound. So this is not related to the source of the, of the molecule, natural product or synthetic. 
continuing on the theme of resistance, the resistance studies typically done both for natural products and uh, antibiotic molecules uh, discovered in other ways um, are to select for resistant mutants um, in the laboratory. But most of the clinically relevant drug resistances are transferable. As you're mining for antibiotics from natural products, what is the likelihood there will be natural resistance in the environment already? Well, there are mechanisms for resistance from the producer strain, so that this uh, mechanism can be transferred within the environment and the resistance will always be there. The point is just the fact of being able to overcome this in the clinic because this is a fact that we won't be able to fight. I mean, uh, for any compound that uh, we develop, uh, nature has already been developing a resistance mechanism, even from the producer organism for, or for any of the community that is uh, just uh, coexistent with this, with this strain. So it's just a problem of transmission, it's a problem of being able to translate that into the, into the community. So uh, at the end, uh, this is something that uh, cannot be by, by default overcome uh, in, the, in the sense, uh, and this doesn't mean that uh, this, this is the reason because they are just coming from natural products that they will have a better chances to develop a resistance. So it's more on the, on the fact that which is the target and how you're aiming to, to kill the, the potential pathogen. Thank you. At this point, although I have several more questions, I just want to indicate how many people are thanking you for your talk and saying how nice your talk was. So uh, moving okay. on then to the next question, uh, this is about open science. So if you discover an antimicrobial compound through fermentation or microbiome mining, can you file a patent for this compound? The questioner is saying that they thought that bacteria and what they produce belong to everyone. Well, this is not coming from uh, the my microbiome, human microbiome, and this is a, a question that is still at stake. Of course, uh, we can patent natural products, except in, in the US, that uh, is really um, more, much more difficult to, to, to manage to get a, a patent or just a protection on a, on a natural product. So there are other ways to, to do that, to protect uh, uh, this IP. Uh, this is a question for those who are just engaged more and more in the microbiome field and just figuring out, in fact, who, who is the owner of the, the bacteria that is being obtained from a, from a human sample. And uh, I don't have the clues now because we have not been exposed to this situation, but uh, this would be very interesting to discuss uh, how, how to manage the, the ownership of the bacterial isolates not only just from the patenting purpose, but also from the perspective of the Nagoya protocol and the benefit sharing. So that's something that uh, would be also another topic for discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is that uh, this uh, questioner uh, proposes that uh, producing microbes will not produce the secondary metabolite because it is a defense molecule, unless there is the um, target for that molecule, i.e. perhaps a competing bacterium. So therefore, is it useful to screen the, both the, the producer or the putative producer in the presence of a competing bacterial species to, even if they are dead, to see if there are new secondary metabolites in that culture? Yeah, this is one of the approaches in, and there are many, many different types of co-culturing approaches that are exploring this, uh, this interaction uh, between dead cells, the, between the cells, uh, between molecules that can be just acting as signals to trigger the production of new molecules. 
and in fact for the discovery process this is great in the sense because we have the tools as well from this uh, cultivation not only not only one to one but also uh, microbial assemblages that can help to discover this, uh, this novel chemistry, we can detect the presence of uh, these compounds. Later on, of course, if you want to move into development, you need to identify who is the strain or strains that are able to produce this, this compound. And if you, you cannot manage to do that uh, from a co-cultivation, then being able to translate into a more synthetic approach to ensure that you can produce the compound. But for the detection purposes, this is something that has been used, of course. Thank you. This is moving back to a more general question about pharmaceutical companies or big academic institutions or universities. Are you aware of how many of them are fully equipped and actively pursuing uh, natural product antibiotic screening and analysis. Uh, is this an area that is very active or is it an area that um, is, has sort of gone down in being popular in recent years? Well, this is an emerging area more in the early stages and in fact there is a, is a large community and the community is also being establishing networks trying to, to manage to get all these expertise and moving, moving ahead. Uh, but the point is that uh, despite in the early stages for discovering novel compounds, there is still a gap in how to move after this stage. So in terms of uh, compound development and even development into, into the clinic, there are no ways to, to fund many of this type of research. So, but the, the community is there and is really, really moving into this direction, yeah. Thank you. So I have two questions here that are interrelated. So I'm going to ask them both, uh, which makes it quite long, but I hope you'll, when, you get to, when I get to the end, you'll understand why I've put them both together. So the first question is, early on in your presentation, you indicated that there was a 0.1% rate of conversion of natural products into a drug used in patients. So that's the first question is why have not more of these drugs uh, been developed? And then the second question is every day, many natural products are discovered and published in the scientific literature, often high profile journals but very few of them are studied properly at the preclinical level. So the question is, instead of completely focusing on finding more and more new natural products, should we not pay attention to the molecules that have already been published with good activity and start to develop those? Because if we keep on doing discovery, development lags behind and it'd be difficult to take a molecule all the way into a new treatment for patients? Well, one, one thing is not against to, to the other, and I think that everybody in the field for any new component that is being uh, published and looks promising uh, would look more carefully into, into these aspects in, in seeing how this can be evolved. Of course, um, many of the compounds that are being described, uh, for sure, they won't be amenable to be to be developed into into the clinic and the point perhaps would be just to put in place a clear uh, path forward about how to assess the potential development uh, characteristics of any of any compound to be to be uh, devoting resources another point of, of uh, an odd, another reason uh, for the lack of uh, of compounds being developed much more from the academic perspective besides this publication is because there is no resources, there is no funding to do this kind of work. So uh, this moment uh, is, is very, it's very difficult to, to find uh, the means to, to, to screen for the potential uh, 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 characterization of these new compounds that are being described uh, on every day. But uh, I, I don't think uh, we are missing molecules that uh, are being left there, being published, and nobody has been looking at them more carefully. Thank you. What is your view 
on the utility of screening the human microbiome for antimicrobial producing strains? Well, we, we also need to have a look at the, the type of strains that are, are enriching our, our microbiome. And uh, of course, uh, many of them uh, are going to be much richer producers of uh, peptides or uh, bioactive peptides. There is still not yet too many large collections or high quality collections just to, to look at them more carefully from, from this perspective. But from the from the genetic uh, genome genome data that are available, of course, there are more richer certain types of uh, biosynthetic genes that uh, in in other in other cases. So perhaps we can expect certain number of molecules being produced more easily by these microbiome related species than what we can find in the in the environment. But uh, this is still uh, interested to. To be, to be explored as well. We are ready to develop certain type of uh, families of compounds that uh, we have not been developing when these were sourced from the environment. Thank you. Could you explain the Nagoya protocol and whether this is uh, inhibiting antibiotic discovery based on natural products? Well, the, the Nagoya protocol uh, has been only, only trying to, to regulate to, to some extent the, the, the transfer and the access to the, to the, to the sources. So this has been implemented after 2015. Anything that has uh, been a sample before that, uh, well, is, is just under the umbrella on the Convention of Biodiversity and the, and the different countries have been regulating the access to their biological resources. So this is something that uh, from, uh, from the side of the industry has been completely accepted many, many years ago, uh, even, even decades since the establishment of the, of the CBD. And uh, for anyone willing to play, to have a role to play in the, in the natural products uh, space, not only just for antibiotics or for any other type of development, uh, this is something that is completely assumed that in fact it will be some some return. Uh, of course, within the the field of antibiotics, this doesn't need to be any limitation because uh, the the fair sharing uh, with the, with the countries of origin at the end is something that you need to to negotiate in these cases. And uh, of course, I imagine that in the case of antibiotics, uh, a scenario will for any potential return from, from there. So this is part as well of the, of the new landscape that we have for the commercial exploitation from, from these sources. Thank you. So this is a question about um, natural products and new targets. Some of the natural products that have been described in recent years have also been shown to inhibit targets that were not previously known. Do you think that natural product research, whilst it does not always yield new drugs, is very useful in yielding new targets for which others could screen their libraries for inhibitors, which could become drugs? Yeah, that's perfectly uh, acceptable in the sense that, in fact, uh, from the drug discovery from, from microbial natural, uh, natural products, at the end, uh, this can be just a compound that cannot be developed, but this is a tool to just uh, validate, uh, validate a target and then from there, just using this as a starting point for the development of uh, semi-synthetic, of just completely synthetic compounds. So if this is a source of inspiration, this is, has a very high value in managing to, to overcome uh, uh, the, the problem of infection. Yeah. Thank you. So coming back to the properties of the wide diversity of natural products, are there uh, databases that can have revealed the physical or other chemical property clues in those natural products to either avoid um, when wanting to translate that natural product into a new drug 
or to optimize or exploit? To my knowledge, that I don't think there are just specialized databases just focusing on that. And what, uh, what we know is that, in fact, also uh, natural products do not match most of the rules that are being used by uh, synthetic uh, or just medicinal chemistry for developing, for developing any, any drug. So these are being really, really challenges uh, from the perspective of the, of the medicinal chemistry in terms of the, of the complexity of these compounds and, uh, and uh, when the, there's been a success is, is because uh, there's been a minimal votes to, to overcome all these, all these limitations. These are challenges inherent from, to, the, to, the, to the fact that these, uh, these compounds are not planar, are much more three-dimensional, uh, but this is also the advantage in, in many cases when we are targeting certain, certain uh, potential targets in, in different, not only from the perspective of the antibiotics, but for other for other targets as well. Thank you. I have a few technical questions now. Um, could you indicate any major innovations that you recommend uh, should be used when cultivating microorganisms to yield natural products for antibiotic discovery? Well, in fact, this is always based on a lot of uh, serendipity because, in fact, uh, the point of just dealing with uh, wild type strains that uh, we are very limited knowledge about their physiology. Uh, this is something that we are always facing uh, at this problem. So we, we learn from, from the experience. So that's why having all this genomic data all put together are uh, being used more and more just to try to infer from their potential behavior just to more and more focus uh, the, the way we are cultivating and the way we are uh, making these strains to express their secondary metabolism. So that's what is novel in how we are managing to work with natural products today and with microbial strains from what was done in the past. But in fact, we didn't have any clue about what was going on and by little. And now we have much more information that is helping us to go a little bit deeper. But we still, there is a lot of lack of information about this huge diversity of microbial strains in the environment. Thank you. Another technical question. Are there specific commercially available culture media or uh, compositions of media that people could make themselves that you recommend for cultivating antimicrobial producing strains, especially actinomycetes? Well, there's a broad range of, I mean, we, we are not using commercial media, we are using very complex media based on our experience from, from the past in, in industry. And normally these are these complex media we are, which are much more um, pro productive in terms of, uh, of how the strains are behaving. No matter that later on when we want to move food to development, well, we always need to simplify and, and need to, to introduce some rationale in how what these nutrients are being inspired by strains. So the uh, normal trend is just to, to produce uh, the, this media in-house from a different type of, of complex components so I, I don't really have a, an answer related to that. And in fact, uh, there is a, a large collection of media in house that are being used depending on the type of strength, even for, for actinomycetes. Thank you. Uh, in uh, one of your slides, you listed various strains that you use for determining the mode of action of a natural product antibiotic. Are those strains publicly available? And if yes, where can one obtain them? Well, I have been listed examples. Some of them are just being developed uh, at the, in, the, in the pharmaceutical escape. So these are, this is not uh, available. In other cases, these are just uh, strains that are available in, in, in public institutions, in universities. So it depends, it depends, uh, I mean, these technologies have been published, uh, but depending who has been developing them, uh, they, they made them available or not. So, but some of them are, of course, uh, available to the community. 
Thank you. So this is a question that's uh, come up in, in various ways. So I'm, I'm going to uh, ask it and, and hope that you'll be able to answer uh, based on your experience or that of being part of the natural product antibiotic community. If you have a promising um, bioactive molecule with no significant toxicity when tested in the test tube type experiments, not in animals, how would you find a partner to help you take that compound to the next stage and move towards preclinical experiments and then onwards if you were successful into clinical development? Well, today the, the only options that come to my mind are these, uh, these uh, accelerators that are being put in place in Europe, such as the Enable program that in fact was just being uh, fed by, by molecules that had a good profile but didn't have any uh, data in animals. Uh, and then uh, there were the resources and, and there was the, the expertise within these platforms to, to move very quickly with these candidate molecules to have just uh, the data in terms of uh, uh, animal efficacy, animal toxicity, and then potential liabilities just to, to be able to, to nominate uh, a leader to, to start the development of this compound. So these, uh, these type of uh, programs are being uh, launched, uh, I think, not only just in Europe, but as well in, in the US. And uh, to me, it's probably the, the, the only way to, to go faster and being able to, to, to develop a, a potential compound. Thank you. And a, a question following up on that is about your own work. Do you have any uh, current candidates in clinical trials at the moment? No, we don't have any, any clinical trials at, at this moment. This is something that ourselves, uh, this is far beyond the, the scope within our organization. Uh, and this is something that uh, we don't foresee to do alone and this will need to be done of course, in collaboration or just within one of these platforms or just with, uh, with another company. Thank you. So you mentioned several environments uh, from which natural products have been obtained and you also indicated there are numerous natural product libraries around the world. Do you believe there are still environments that will yield microbes that produce new products have never been seen before? Yeah, I'm really convinced that, that uh, the limitation is how we are looking at these environments and, and these communities and how we can get rid of what is common to uncover, uncover unique, unique strains. So uh, having the tools that we have at hand now just to go very quickly and deeply uh, to, to identify these unique isolates and, and look at them more carefully is, is what is going to help us just to complement just uh, the collections that, that we have. Uh, we have examples of cases that we have been discovering, uh, very, very interesting compounds uh, with one single isolate that we didn't manage to get across our whole collection uh, any other producer. And there are many other cases that no matter what your sample, you're isolating again and again and again the same compound, what you have been identifying this. So I, I think this uh, there is uh, very much uh, the, the environment that is going to be selecting as well for very unique unique producers. And there are very uh, assemblages uh, out there that are still uh, um, meriting to be, to be exploited. Okay. Uh, do you know whether there is a website or similar uh, a forum for the natural product antibiotic community where people can find out information about protocols for isolating natural products, databases to allow them to dereplicate. In other words, a, a one stop for people to find information, such as some of the questions they've been asking today. Uh, well, I, I don't, I'm not aware of, of the existence of this uh, uh, database or web pages uh, doing that. Uh, of course, I'm not so much on the more academic teaching area and probably those people more in this area are more familiar with that. 
but of course this will be extremely helpful for those newcomers in the field just to, to get to the point and to get the right starting point and avoiding to reinvent the wheel when there is a lot of knowledge there that also is uh, we are risking as well to, to lose because there are generations that are going to, to move out from the, from the field. So this is also, if it's not existing, it would be also very, very interesting as an idea to have a community-based uh, uh, platform for that. Thank you. I, at this point, I th would like to indicate to the audience that Guard P is developing both a library and uh, an antimicrobial uh, encyclopedia, which will be launched in 2020. So perhaps we can help address uh, some of these questions for the community. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that time has now run out for us in terms of asking you more questions. So I'd like to thank you once again, Olga, what a fantastic webinar you've given and the audience for their very many questions. So before everybody leaves, please can I announce that we have more webinars coming. On the 7th of November, Paul Hergenrother from the University of Illinois will talk about converting gram-positive only compounds into broad spectrum antibiotics. The website is already open for you to register for this webinar, so please re visit the Revive website. Then on the 26th of November, we are pleased to present a webinar in collaboration with the Longitude Prize by Nesta Challenges on the topic of innovation in point of care diagnostics for sepsis and bloodstream infections. This webinar will take place at 9.30 a.m. Central European time. This is to enable researchers from Asia and parts of Australia to join live. You will be able to register for this webinar very soon. So thank you, everybody for joining today and contributing to this lively discussion. As always, I hope that you found this webinar useful and interesting and you'll join us again soon. Please do tell all your networks and encourage your colleagues to join too. Thank you once again, Olga. I've had one final question, but it's not really a question for you. This is summing up much of the uh, feedback we've had. Thank you for a really interesting and inspirational seminar. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for, for your time and for all the questions. It was a pleasure to share this time with all of you. Thank you.